we also have um, system, systems in place that can um, encourage our daughters to, you know, step out of, of what the popular idea is mm -hmm. and really push those ideas um, and push against them. Because I think that as a Latina, that's a lot of what we have to do. We have to continue to push against stigmas and stereotypes and things that are said about us, told, about, told to us. That might not be us. That might not be a part of us. And, you know, I know a lot of Latinos that don't speak Spanish whatsoever, and I think that that's okay, right? Um, but I also think that um, it's okay to speak it, and it's not just okay. I think that we need to push that as uh, a positive trait, right? Something that um, should be should be fond upon. Like, I, I, you know, I think back and I'm like, how different would it be if somebody had walked up to my mom and, and spoke to her in English and said, I would love to learn Spanish. This is great that you speak it. I can teach you English. You teach me Spanish. Let's work together. And why can't it be more like that, right? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and that's why I wanted to bring you on because I want you to just share about your book of and, course. And That's I was reading some of you. yeah, your poetry me. and it's so beautiful. You're so talented. Muchas gracias. So, I appreciate that. I think that este, for a long time, um, it was very difficult este, growing up uh trying to incorporate English and Spanish in my daily life, right? Um, where jobs hire you to speak Spanish, but that's the end of that, right? In 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 rooms where you're in spaces with other co-workers, it's shunned upon. Like you can't speak Spanish when you're not in front of the person that needs it. And I think that um, there's been turning points in my life where I was like, you know what, this is not how I want to um, remember and um, take in my Spanish. I, I really want to uh, put something out into the world that um, is both in Spanish and English, both my truths, right? Two languages that I grew up with um, that make sense to me and, um, and empower women because I think that uh, sometimes we, we, there's a lot that we have to do. Um, we have trouble setting boundaries. Uh, we have trouble um, saying no, especially when we're coming from uh, families that things are, are lacking, right? There's lack of, lack of this, lack of that. Um, you know, I, I translated for the, mo for the majority part of my uh, elementary school for my parents. Um, and I, I internalized a lot of, um, a lot of negative feelings towards, um, the Spanish language. And I think that, um, this is a reclaiming of that, you know, in my book, um, called, uh, Warrior Guerrera, Sayings and Affirmations para la Guerrera isn't just for, um, you know, these beautiful women out there that know English and Spanish that want to, um, you know, be inspired, but it's also for me to, um, Put myself out there, out there in a way where I, I am comfortable in both those languages, and I I can say, hey, like these two things are important to me, and that's okay, for myself. And that was um that was a very uh, difficult journey, <laughs> and and I'm glad that I'm here now. But there's so much more work to do. So I mean, thank you for having me on here for sure. I'm really excited. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I, we just dove right into the conversation without introducing you. So can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? So my name is Vidalis Vera. Um, I was born in Connecticut, um, in the barrios in Connecticut. Um, you know, we, my mom came here from Puerto Rico um, in 1988, uh, pregnant with me. And um, we lived in a barrio in Connecticut uh, right up until I was around four. And that's when we moved to Massachusetts um, when she um, got into a relationship with, uh, with a man and we moved here and I've been here in Massachusetts ever since. Um, you know, my, my upbringing has been, um, I, I, you know, I, I was in the lower socioeconomic economic class for a very long time. You know, we, um, we, we lacked basic health care. We lacked um, food sometimes. We lacked uh, parenting. We lacked a lot of different things. And it wasn't because of uh, our parents not trying. I think it, it had a lot to do with their own internalization of what this society in America thought of them and um, where they 
um, ended up was, uh, you know, just sort of in a, in a, in a vicious cycle of never having enough. Um, and I told myself when I was really young, like, I never want to be here. I never want to live this same cycle. And so I had to start to break these generational, I don't want, I don't like the word curses, but in a way it's, it's that right. All these, these generational, you know, barriers that, uh, really have kept us, um, sort of down or, or in a lower socioeconomic class or just, you know, silent. Uh, and for me, um, after I graduated high school and I was able to get to get into college, it was very important to me to work in the human service field. And I've worked as a rehousing stabilization counselor for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I've worked in shelters. I have worked um, um, as an aide to people in need. I have worked as a translator. I have worked um, and, and now I do um, social work uh, for a living which all those, those things I'm super passionate about. But I think that uh, what's imp most important to me is that when there is a voice that is silenced, we need to raise it up and we need to really understand what's going on there. Um, so that, you know, these kids right now that are going through maybe what I went through as a child can, can learn that there's something else out there, that they are able to make a difference, that they are able to, um, move socioeconomic classes, although it is incredibly difficult to do that um, in the United States. And I think that a lot of people don't know that, like you can't just uh, go from being uh, poor to middle class or just go from being middle class to upper class. That just doesn't happen in the blink of an eye. There's a lot of work that goes into that, um, especially when your systems are systems in that same class. So for me, it was important to, um, yeah, just uh, give back to a community that I that sort of lifted me up when I needed um, when I needed to be lifted up and show me, hey, like there is more out there than what you've experienced and you are worth it. And um, yeah, and I and this book is just a reclaiming of um, Spanish and English for women to inspire women to go out there and um, break barriers because it's so important to do that and it's not going to be overnight and it's going to be hard sometimes and sometimes you're not going to want to move or do anything and that's okay but tomorrow is another day um, and it's possible so yeah. oh thank you so much you touched on so much and I'm going to go back a little bit because of course it's important to touch on now your upbringing I think that many Latinx or people of color or just people who are who live in the lower socioeconomic class can relate to you what you said that it's really hard to to move up and mm -hmm. and that you did yeah we go through the hardships of not always having food on the table not having stable housing not having parenting because our parents are taking on one two three whatever jobs they can to provide for us and even with all of those jobs they can still barely provide which makes things so hopeless sometimes for some people and which is why some people even turn to doing things that they shouldn't do to make, earn a living like joining gangs or selling drugs or selling their bodies many other different things but what I love is that you also emphasize that there is hope if you look for it, you're going to find it. If you've got to work hard, you, you have to work hard. There is no magic overnight success. Um, okay. When people say, oh my gosh, you, you, you blow up overnight. What I love that some artists or some people who blow up overnight say in public is actually, I've been working hard at this for like mm -hmm. the last 15 years. And people are like, no way. And mm -hmm. the same thing it, it happens with us, average folks who are not the superstars. We're working really, really hard over a span of so many years to achieve what people see as success. And so what I like about your book that you're writing, this beautiful poetry, is that you are elevating, you are touching the soul of a person. And I've seen your work on your website and the way that you eloquently put these words together to, I mean, seriously hit the soul is incredible. So I wanted you to come on and, and tell us about yourself and about this book. So, um, so tell me when you, 
were writing this book, mm -hmm. did you, or, or just before writing it, what, was there a specific event that made you realize I need to write this book? Um, that's hard. I think that, um, you know, I, growing up, I had a very, um, distant relationship and close relationship. And I don't know if this is going to make sense, but I've, I had this weird, um, dichotomy with, with my mother who we're going to call mommy with mommy, right. Where, um, you know, she had to work these long hours or, you know, she wasn't just available for me, but I knew that she was there. You know, I knew that through her food and through her actions that she loved me and that she was there for me. And I think that for me, um, because I broke, I broke out and I um, sort of did my own thing um, after I left home and I went to college, you know, the first one to go to college in, in my household. Um, and that was a lot different for her. From, for her, it was kind of a shock and not in a bad way, but she was, she was incredibly proud. But I, I think that there was not, I want to say it was a little fear, like, you know, will she leave me forever? Will I never see my daughter again after this? And that for me, um, you know, it was, this book was about um, tying my mother back into my life um, and saying, no, you know, mommy, your Spanish is important to me. And, um, and although I am, I can, you know, I can graduate from whatever college, I can have whatever job, I can write a million books, I can be a bestseller anywhere, but you are still my mother and I still value you and I am the person that I am because of you. And I think this book, um, Guerrera, was, was really a book that I started to write or these affirmations I started to write for her, to honor her. Um, and it turned into more because I wanted to honor all women um, that uh, have value or value the Spanish and the English language together that, that has brought value to them. Um, and that that speak that do that every day, right? I go to mommy's house and we talk in English and Spanish the whole time we're there. It's not just one way or the other. Um, we're, we're in a space where both those languages are so important to us. And I think that, um, writing this book really started off with her and then ended off with, um, you know, there's not, you know, mommy's not the only one. I'm not the only one. My daughter's not going to be the only one. There's so many women out there that um, will code switch immediately into a different room. There's so many women out there that have been looked down upon speaking their native language in a, in a public space. There's so many women out there that have been told to shut up to not say anything to, you know, that they're not important because of the language that they speak. And I think for me, um, yeah, this book is just reclaiming some power back and saying, no, like, you know, studies show that, you know, somebody that, uh, that knows two languages is, is actually smarter. You know, we, we were able to, um, and we were able to to internalize that those two languages, but also you know when we're talking about um, f white people or folk that are uh, of American descent, white Americans, um, and they learn a new language, we um, you know everybody claps, hey great, like you learned a new language, so why can't we do that for our Latina women that are learning English? You know why does it have to always be? Um, someone's making fun of them or someone doesn't understand them or, you know, just, um, you know, it, it's always um, or not always, but a lot of the times or a lot of the uh, examples that I've seen in real life and that I've read about have been negative. And I, I, I think that just has to do with, um, I think it just has to do with racism. <laughs> and um, and I hope that my book can really, um, again, just elevate women to be like, you know what, no, like English and Spanish, they can live together and they can live together in a way that is har harmonious. Um, and yeah, not one language is better than the other. So yeah, that's sort of where I'm coming from with that. I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, you earlier you said that you had a hard time with Spanish. Uh, I think you you meant to say some, or I, I can't remember the, spe the specific word you said, but you avoided Spanish. Is that what you said? Something yeah, like so in high school, I think that there's a lot of pressure 
Um, so for me, um, you know, I, I wrote um, I wrote something actually. I wrote a piece called that I haven't shared yet. It's called the Gualas, and it was about um, what we called um, people that only spoke Spanish in school and high school. They were called the Gualas, right? And I was born and raised in the United States of America, so I could code switch pretty quickly. I spoke really, really. I, I suppose spoke Spanish really well and I spoke English really well. So in high school, I internalized the hate. Um, and what I did was that, you know, they were uh, at the at the front of the school to the right. And so I would walk to the front of the school and take a left and walk up and go down the hall and avoid them completely because I did not want to be associated with the Gualas in school, the ones that only spoke Spanish, that wore their flag on their shirts, you know, that, um, that, said meester or meeses you know um that weren't able to enunciate in english and you know i think back and there's a lot of guilt there um i have a lot of guilt and i had to write that piece because i had to put it out there because it, it was my truth right like i was i was one of those kids that just did not want to associate with people that spoke only spanish i was afraid of the backlash and um, our most of our professors or teachers in school um, only let us speak Spanish when somebody had to use the bathroom or we had to translate. That's when it was okay, but everything else um, that was shunned upon, we we couldn't do it. Um, and our classmates internalized that as well and would would tell us, "Hey, like that's not cool. You're not cool. Why are you doing that? Like you sound weird." Um, and so I, I internalized that for three years in high school. Uh, and yeah, I was, um, I was the main girl. I, I, I didn't want anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. And I think back and I'm like, you know, mommy must have felt terrible um, when she was in a public space and people did what I did. They walked to the right, went up and let her just le left her there. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of um, where that came from. Um, and then what's interesting was that years later, when I had my daughter, um, she was around seven years old. And I had, you know, I had really um, been pushing, you know, Spanish is really important. Your grandma's, your grandma speaks Spanish. You need to understand her. She needs to understand you. Like, this is the importance of it. And then one time on a car ride, she goes like, I hate speaking Spanish. I hate Spanish. And my heart broke into so many pieces, but I had to sit back and, and sit with it and say, I'm not gonna freak out because I've been here. You know, I know what society makes us think. I know that um, peer influences and and systems are, are strong and I just have to keep at it. And that's what I did um, day in and day out. I said, you know, I would be like, hey, um, you know, Spanish is important. It's so, it's so you're so smart for knowing two languages. Um, and eventually, you know, now when she's 13, she's 13, she's, um, she speaks both English and Spanish and she translates for her, for her grandmother, especially for some of the grandkids that don't, you know, haven't been, had the opportunities to speak that Spanish. She's like, you know, don't, don't talk to grandma like that. I know what you're saying. Um, or um, speak to her in, in, in Spanish. I know you can say this word. And you know, she's become um an advocate for the Spanish language but it took a little bit because again like she went to school and she she saw what I saw right like Spanish isn't allowed here you shouldn't be speaking that like, I can't I can't understand you um so I'm happy that that's how it turned out but I can only imagine other kids that you know aren't pushed because you know there's other things to worry about like food on the table or surviving or where am I going to sleep tonight you know um so yeah, I mean, that's sort of where we are now. And, and I'm hoping to um, still, you know, go in that direction because there's so much, I have so much to learn um, still. And I think uh, so does my daughter. And um, yeah, I, I, we just wanna be advocates for the Spanish language and for that to be normalized here and everywhere because it, it, it shouldn't be what it is sometimes and the stigma can affect lives. Um, Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing that story because you know what? I too didn't want to associate with children who spoke only Spanish because I didn't want to be stigmatized the way that they were. And I wasn't mean to them or anything. I kind of just stayed away. Mm -hmm. Now also because I couldn't relate to them because of the origin of nationality that they are from. 
Mm. Uh, so I was usually the only Central American person. So even their dialect of Spanish, I, I didn't like it because it was not familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So I felt like an outcast and I actually felt judged for not being like them. But mm -hmm. I did see that stigma from the non-speaking population, non non-Spanish speaking population, predominantly people not Latinx, who would make comments. And I remember thinking how much I hated that, but I also didn't want to get caught up in that. Mm -hmm. And like you, I look back later and I I felt like I had betrayed my own people, my own Latinos. Mm -hmm. And and I had to quarrel and live with that for so long. And then uh, I also, I remember being sometimes embarrassed that my mom wouldn't say English words correctly. And then something happened along the way where I realized, you know what, this is an injustice. This is stupid. Like, I am so proud of every single person who has an accent because that just shows how much willpower, dedication, and motivation you have to take on a whole different language where most quote unquote Americans don't bother to do that. Even when they go to other countries in areas of tourism, they want to be catered to with their own language instead of trying even a little bit to say a few words, you know, to show respect. And one of the things I teach in my bullying courses now is that when, um, because this is all a, a unconscious bias or an unconscious stereotype that we allow to hold uh, rent in our brains, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is the example I give them. Think of it as, you know, you have two people, one is Latinx with a, you know, speaking English with an accent. And then you have somebody from Europe, let's say somebody French. And notice how the reactions are, are given by others. So when they speak English, both have accents. Usually mm -hmm. for the French person, they're like, oh my gosh, like you said, the, the white people are praised. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it sounds so beautiful. I, I don't it's even know like what you're it. saying. Yeah, like I, or I could hear you all day long. But then a Latino or Latina says something and they're like, go back to your own country. You need to, or like speak English mm -hmm. better. When are you going to learn how to not to speak better? And it's so unfair mm -hmm. because it takes the same amount of effort regardless of where you come from. But the problem is that our society has inculcated this stereotype that Latinx people with an accent are just not smart enough, but Europeans are, maybe it's because of their color, maybe it's something else, but I definitely do believe that has a lot to do with racism. Absolutely. Uh, unconscious racism at that. Mm -hmm. so, and, and thank you for sharing the story about your daughter too, because I too, man, I was like, yes, mis hijas van a aprender el español and they're going to speak both languages and they were doing really well. And then school started. Mm -hmm. because we were in a predominantly white area and their peers were predominantly white and non non-spanish speaking they came home and they said i don't want to learn it mm -hmm. i was crushed too El dolor. Like, oh my gosh it's like no this is part of our roots this is something to be proud of i mean i, I even did the talk of like you're going to get paid one day for just knowing that language porque, you know, no todo el mundo toma el tiempo to educate themselves mm -hmm. of another language. So thank you so much for being vulnerable enough to share about you having been mm -hmm. that person who avoided being stigmatized. Um, and, and what's beautiful about your story is that you, you learn from it and you were able to help your daughter and you did it with a with a, um you did it with um with love mm -hmm. you, know, you kept telling her you know talk to grandma in espanol and, mm -hmm. and i'm glad to hear that now she's speaking it well and i think also when you do things that make people excited like your book and i mean your your book i can only imagine because if the stuff that i read on your website is amazing um it got me really excited and I can, and, and so if you do exciting things like that, that can inspire kids to be excited about their background, I think that's a success. And that's how you can get kids or anybody to embrace just about anything about them that, that they have been told that is not good or not acceptable. Absolutely. 
Um, thank you for sharing your story. I think that, um, you know, it was nice to hear, you know, that that's something that not not just I and 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 you know you know that but just to hear it right to be like you know as a mom I also went through this um it's it's a breath of fresh air you know to know that there um although this is happening we also have um system systems in place that can um encourage our daughters to you know step out of of what the popular idea is mm -hmm. and really push those ideas um and push against them because i think that as a latina that's a lot of what we have to do we have to continue to push against stigmas and stereotypes and things that are said about us told about told to us um that that we we might not that we might not um that might not be us that might not be a part of us um and, you know, I know a lot of Latinos that don't speak Spanish whatsoever, and I think that that's okay, right? Um, but I also think that um, it's okay to speak it, and it's not just okay, I think that we need to push that as uh, a positive trait, right? Something that um should be should be fond upon like i i you know i think back and i'm like how different would it be if somebody had walked up to my mom and, and spoke to her in english and said i would love to learn spanish this is great that you speak it i can teach you english you teach me spanish let's work together and why can't it be more like that right um and even at, even in jobs when I was um, in college, I remember being hired by a, uh, an amazing Colombian strong woman. She was um, she was great, you know. And I remember walking up to the counter, you know, that she had little. There was a little pink slip on the sign, and, and it said, "Oh, you know, we're looking for a work study student." And I walked up and I said, "Hi, my name is Medalis. I will be the best work study you've ever had. Please hire me." And she looked straight straight at me and says do you speak Spanish? And I'm like, and I hesitated. And that hesitation lives with me every day because I was like, I took a deep breath and I was like, what kind of doctrine has me challenging the idea that I don't know Spanish? This is the, the language I first laughed in, I first cried in, I first, um, you know, watch TV and I first uh, listen to my mom's words in Spanish. What kind of society do I live in where I had to really sit with do I speak Spanish? Um, yes, I do. And I took a deep breath and I said, see, you know, I do speak Spanish. And she looked at me and she said, you know, you're hired, you know, and that same woman, which I, you know, she's one of my mentors now and I, and I appreciate everything she's done, but we've been in spaces where both of us have felt, oh, we're in a space at work that no clients are here. So we can't speak Spanish together and we know it. And she could probably teach me a, a thing or two about Spanish, yet she was never comfortable doing it outside of what it what we were hired to do it for, which was to speak to our clients about it, uh, to, or to speak to our clients to facilitate. Um, well, at that time, the, the the job that I was hired for was um, actually the financial aid department in one of the community college I was, community colleges I was in. But um, yeah, you know, I think back and I'm like, I as an adult had difficulties with um, the Spanish language and owning it. I can only imagine what our kiddos are going through right now. And that really needs to change in public schools. That should not be the doctrine that, or or the, the uh, main energy in there. It shouldn't be, oh, like we need to stay away from the kids that speak Spanish. You know, we should learn from them. We, and we need a better system to do so for sure. I agree. You know, that's such a good point because I think about all the friends that I have in, say, Europe uh, and or in Latino America, and a lot of them tell me that they are offered a second or third language to learn as early as elementary school. Mm -hmm. So it makes it less scary to be on the same journey as everybody else, right? Because when it's just you learning another language, you're you have the fear of being laughed at because you're the only person willing to try to say something that you know you're going to butcher. But then when you have a school full of kids who are all on that same journey, then they know they're going to sound silly. And but that's going to that's okay, because you're expected to because you're all learning together. And the only school that I know of so far is my niece and nephew in Arizona, they're four and five, and they go to this elementary school where half of the day, 
all kids, regardless of what race, color, gender they are, they have class only in English. And then the other half of the class is only in Spanish. Wow. Yeah. And I was so I happy that. Because, because their father is white and, and my sister, Nicaragüense. So she speaks it, but they speak more English. And I, and I was like, man, don't be like me because, you know, I kind of stopped teaching my kids because I saw how discouraged they were. And then I got bogged down. And then mm -hmm. I, I, like, I didn't know, how, I didn't want to push it to the point mm -hmm. to where they were going to hate it. And, and so I was like, what do I do? I don't know. But now they've come around and they're both learning it. So they still mm -hmm. don't, they can't carry a full conversation, but they can definitely, you can't talk about them behind your back, <laughs> behind their back anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So. And, and I feel like when we're breaking um, generational barriers or these curses, I think that it's it's a lot of work. And I think that as one person or as one woman, sometimes um, it bec it becomes a lot, right? We have to, we, we are trying to parent our children the best we can. We are trying to have a successful career. We're trying to move move into a different socioeconomic class. We're trying to um, own property and make sure that we, um, learn financial literacy, like there are so many hats that we wear that sometimes something isn't going to, um, you know, happen at the time that we want it to happen. And that has to be okay, because we're not on the same playing field and we haven't been since we were born. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I commend you uh, for, you know, doing what you could, because that's what it's about doing what you can, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And you too. I mean, I, I really you. love your story because you you truly, you are an example of that American dream. Mm -hmm. You are, I mean, no, you're not an immigrant. You were born here, but mm -hmm. still you were that American who didn't, who grew up not having it all. And now you're a homeowner. You have a well-established career. You love what you do. You have a healthy family. And I know that things are not perfect. Like nobody's life is perfect. Nope. Mm -hmm. But here you are, and you're still pushing yourself. You're Absolutely. People, which is something mm -hmm. that most people don't dare. People have so many stories to share. And I always tell people, like, share your story. If you can write it down, share your story, because everybody needs to hear it, because we always learn from somebody's story. And here you are. Uh, you're going to publish your book. Can you tell us when can we expect the book to be available? Of course. Um, so I am... Uh, self-publishing the book on April 1st. Um, I, you know, it's been a, like we, we spoke about this um, earlier on prior to us filming. It's been a very tough month uh, because I do work in social work and sometimes things are just not, you know, roses. It's, it's it can be a very difficult, um, challenging job, but I'm expecting to uh, have the book ready on April 1st. And just to go back to what you were saying, it's about that. It's about showing women, hey, or Latina women or women that speak both English and Spanish, like, hey, like, yes, it's okay to um, not be okay today and to take a take a rest day. But tomorrow, tomorrow, you have to remember who you are. And tomorrow, you have to stand up for what you believe in. Um, because there are so many forces out in the world, telling us who we are and what we shouldn't do. Um, and I want to be that force that tells us, you know what, maybe we need to think about this in a different way. Maybe, maybe I am capable of doing things even though I can't speak English perfectly or speak Spanish perfectly or write both languages perfectly, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and, you know, I hope that with my book, um, you know, that you're able to see that, that you're able to see, you know, just a little bit of the power that you can have um, when you rec reclaim yourself in this space that can be very difficult to do so. Um, and I commend anyone that is able to stand up from a really bad place, especially, um, you know, migrant and immigrant Latinos that are coming from spaces that, you know, I have no idea what, what they've been through. But, um, you know, I, I have heard and read stories that um, have touched me in ways that I, you know, I, I live with, you know, like the, the, our comrades in, in different um, Latinidades, right, in different parts of the world are going through things that I can only imagine, and they're being, they're coming here and being mar marginalized and being treated poorly and being put in cages and being, um, treated as less than human and that's a problem and I hope that um you know as I move forward in my journey as a writer you know I 
am able to uplift a lot of a lot not just let you know puerto rican latinos or latinos from um new england or anything like that but just latinos all all around latinas all around um that really find themselves in spaces where they don't you know they're just they're they're at their wit's end you know they can't do it anymore you know but you can and and it's worth it definitely and what is the title of your book of course, um, the title the title of my book is um, "Warrior Guerreras: Sayings and Affirmations para las Guerreras," um, and it's um, it's like a chapbook. It's it's not more than a hundred pages, and it's um, short phrases and affirmations in Spanglish, English and Spanish, that just um, I hope get into your head a little bit, right? And and it's like it's like when somebody turns out that, that new that that first merengue on during the party right where you're just like oh i gotta go dance right and so this book is about oh oh i just heard that i gotta go dance i gotta go do something i gotta take action right. so thank you so much and where thank you. will people be able to buy your book so my uh my book will be available for purchase on amazon um right now um that will be um, the space where you're able to find it. And I will have the links um, of that on my social media. So I can share that with you. So you can share it with your audience as well so that um, you guys can look out for it. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, please do share. Where can we find you on social media? Yeah, so um, so my social media tag is dali.wolf, um, D-A-L-I dot W-L-F, um, wolf, um, WLF came from um, the acronym writer, lighter, uh, <laughs> writer, lover, fighter. Um, and it was something that I, I kept thinking about, like, you know, I love to write. Um, I have fought many battles and um, I want women all over the world to feel the love. Right. So that's where that came from. Um, so, yeah, it's Dali.Wolf on Instagram, Dali.Wolf on Twitter. Um, and I also have a Facebook, um, if you're able to look it up, D-A-L-I-W-L-F. I love it. And I love the acronym. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. For Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If you ever want to come back on the show, let's make it happen. Please. I would love that. Thank you. There you go. Uh, wow. I had such an amazing time speaking with me, Dalis. I, you never know who you're going to meet, right? I met her through Clubhouse. And I just happened to check out her bio and I loved uh, the poetry that I read on her website. And here we are, I mean, collaborating, you know, she's adding value to, to this show by sharing her story so that you can hear it. So I hope that her story helps and I hope that you support her by buying her book. If anything, sharing her posts about her book. So thank you so much for watching it. And don't forget that you can subscribe to my newsletter at dalitalks.com so that you can get insights, be updated on upcoming events and upcoming guests. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.